Good morning. God bless you. God bless this day to give us to be together. And uh, to all those who might be listening and watching uh, through this media called Zoom and inevitably through uh, our Facebook and, and YouTube accounts, uh, that this uh, service might be a blessing to anyone who would um, take the time and the opportunity to listen. We invite you um, as a Catawba charge to worship with us uh, if, if you are so inclined to do that. We invite you into, we have five campuses on the Catawba charge. Uh, this particular meeting is being and will be continue to be uh, produced from Hopewell United Methodist Church in Hopewell. Uh, we have a we have a campus at Kingmont and one at uh, uh, Fairview out on the ridge and, and also at Catawba and Mount Sun uh, out on Morton Ridge. So um, we invite you to listen in, to join in, uh, and 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 be a part of our worship service on Sunday at ten o'clock. So we thank you for your presence here today. I want to share with you this morning out of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's 13th chapter lists a number of, uh, of parables. Can see Jesus tells a number of parables in the 13th chapter of Matthew consecutively. And they're all addressing particularly one thing. It's to answer a question that's even on our hearts today. What's heaven like? Tell me about heaven. And often, as Jesus does in his teaching, he tells a story. He tells a parable. And he starts most of them out in this chapter, particularly. By saying the kingdom is heaven, the kingdom of heaven is life. I've often shared with you how important, how particularly blessed we are as a people who God has chosen to be born in this place called West Virginia. So much of the examples that Jesus uses in the scripture refer to physical things that we know, that we're familiar with. When he talks about a stream, we know what he means. When he talks about the valleys and the mountains, when he talks about the flowers and the hills, when he talks about nature in general, you know what he means. Why? Well, you live it. You see, life isn't this way everywhere. Someone born and raised in the bowels of Chicago or Philadelphia or New York City know what you're talking about when you talk about sidewalks or high-rise buildings or taxi cabs. But there's a large portion of our population today that doesn't know where a chicken's egg comes from. I've, I, I, I've never become more aware than I am today of the language that we use. You know, we use certain terms in the church that we all are, com are, are familiar with and that we use commonly that words that don't translate in the world. What's salvation?
When we talk about communion, what's communion? I never realized that more pertinently than to be dealing with now a workforce that's in their mid-twenties. Their language isn't the same. I take my grandsons out to go fishing. And so I'm trying to give them instructions as to what to do specifically to have, know how to catch fish. And I was telling them every once in a while, I'd say, whoa, 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 you know what? They never did stop because they didn't know what whoa meant. Now think about it. When we came from an era, many of us, when we saw teams of horses working, and we knew what whoa meant. And G meant right and haw meant left. We need to be careful about the language we use and how we describe things so that people in their context can understand. Jesus, nobody, nobody came close to being the teacher that Jesus was. And part of the way he taught was by describing things that people understood, that they were familiar with. So he tells a lot of parables in this chapter 13. And I, I, I thought about doing one or two or three of them. Um, and, and I thought to myself, that's going to be a lot of time to try to cover multiple parables in this chapter. Other than to know that Jesus is answering a pertinent question, what's the kingdom of heaven? And he introduces each one of them, almost each one of them, with the kingdom of heaven as well. I want to focus on one. It's two verses long. And it has to do with the mustard seed. Because I thought it was so pertinent to the circumstance and the situation that we find ourselves in this, this day. Chapter 31, chapter 13, verse 31, begins this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. And it is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in the branches. The word of God for the people of God. So oftentimes, we as human beings allow our perception to become reality. We convince ourselves that things that are going to be a certain way long before they happen, only to realize that we've missed the mark completely. Do you know what I'm speaking about? How you perceive things to be, and then they actually don't turn out that way. That's often expressed in our fears and anxieties, right? The larger portion of what we fear are things that haven't even happened yet. So we get a call from the doctor, oh boy. Oh, I don't like the looks of this. Oh man, if I've got this or if I've got that, or what are we going to do? And you start building a scenario, you have a perception, only to come to find out that you're way off the line. How many times have we had to ask God's forgiveness after we fretted and worried about something that never came to pass? allowed our fears and anxieties to consume us, clouding our minds and paralyzing our action. Too often we allow our perceived notions to creep into reality and ultimately discover 
that we miss the truth by a mile. Brent Blair tells a story, a humorous story, about Thomas Wheeler. Now, Thomas Wheeler was a CEO of uh, uh, Mass Mutual Life Insurance Company. You might have heard of that. It's a pretty big player in the insurance business at one time. Um, Tom and his wife were driving along the interstate, and he noticed that the car was running low on fuel, and so they got off at the very next exit and uh, didn't realize that the gas station, you ever got, you ever done that? You ever got off, you run out of low on gas and you got off and you thought the gas station wouldn't be very far and you ended up traveling miles through the countryside before you found them. That's what happened to Tom. They finally came up on this rundown gas station that had one pump. Now, back in the day, in some places, I believe even in rural, uh, in rural America today, they still have attendants. Yeah. You remember those? Right? You remember attendance. You were, Dave says I was one. And you came to the, the they came up to your car and they say, uh, what can I do for you? Fill it up, clean the windshield on, check the oil. Right? I can remember as a child at Stewart's filling station there on the corner of East Park of Wolverine Town, them having an attendance. So, of course, the attendant came out and uh, Tom got out of his car, his wife stayed there, and he thought, told the attendant to check the oil, wipe the windshield, fill it up. And he was going to take a little stroll around the gas station there just to stretch his legs. When he got back, as he was approaching the car, he saw his wife and this attendant having this animated conversation. And as he got closer to the car, that conversation kind of got it down and he paid the attendant got in the car and as he was driving off, he looked over at his wife and he said, you know this guy? Well, she said, what a coincidence. He and I went to high school together and we dated for almost a year. Well, boy, are you lucky I came along, Brad Wheeler. If you'd have married him, you would have been the wife of a gas station attendant instead of the wife of a CEO. Well, his wife replied, my dear, if I had married him, he'd have been the CEO and you would have been the gas station. <laughs> Praise be to God. Uh, I, you know, I, I can relate to that, to that quite significantly. Because uh, one of the greatest presents I received, ever received or will ever receive in my life, I received on July the 30th of 1977. And uh, I don't know whether I would have been standing in this pulpit had it not been for her influence in my life. And this 30th of July, we'll celebrate 43 of those years together. And she's still the best birthday gift I've ever received. So we often think we've got it all figured out, when in fact we're way off. A mustard seed, a tiny small seed to be exact, I have to ask the question, why does Jesus use such a small thing to represent something so large as the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven? And I believe it's because the presence of heaven is all around us. I believe the presence of heaven is all around us. I believe every time we hand out a glass of cold water, the kingdom comes up. I believe every time we reach out to tell a person we care, and every time that we shake a hand, or used to shake a hand, every time that we say thank you, every time that we say we appreciate you, every time we do that, the kingdom of heaven comes. 
Jesus said it was near because of his presence. And he's handed that off to the church. At first glance, this is a ridiculous statement. You think, why would you use the mustard seed? The mustard seed's as small as a grain of sand, yet it grows into a large bush that birds can nest in its branches. Jesus is saying that God is at work. Even though our human eyes fail to perceive it and our human brains fail to understand it, God is working. God didn't allow this pandemic to close the church. He opened new doors. As Christians, we should understand that imperceivable things have real influence. But we live in a society that is enamored with bigness. The large, the huge, the enormous. We've gone beyond big churches to mega churches. We are entrenched and overwhelmed by huge social problems from hungry children to destroying monuments, the pandemic. As a result, sometimes we overlook the tiny seed problems that are at the root of so many of these difficult situations. You know, every time that, that, that God brings this to my attention, I think, that I, I, I think about the bad where did, did we start out? How many? Can you remember the number when we started? It was below 100, wasn't it? I, I wasn't there until I did a meeting with the nineteen. Okay. And then it went to 75, and then it went to over 100. And now where is it today? 220. 220. And grow. What are we going to do when it gets to 1,000? Same thing. The Holy Son, God will provide. You see what I'm saying? But, the, but you see, that's continuing to feed the children isn't the problem. The seed to that problem is happening in the family. And if we don't correct what's happening in the family, if we don't reach out even deeper than we're reaching to where the problem's growing from, The, 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 that situation is going to continue to explode. There are seed problems there is what I'm trying to say. You remember the Space Shuttle Challenger? Remember that? Remember the tragedy, the disaster that happened? I'll refresh your memory that that was caused by a tiny O-ring. A tiny O-ring Three tenths of an inch wide failed. And whether it was unusually cold weather, any number of potential compression problem, or human error through manufacturing, two tiny o rings failed and the challenger exploded before the watching world, taking all seven crew members' lives. You see, it's a little thing. Tiny microscopic viruses. Heart valves no bigger than a thumbnail. The single vote in an election. An ill-chosen word from a loved one. Little things that have so much power. In the 13th chapter of Matthew records the story of Jesus talking about the smallest thing his audience could relate. Must see. We shouldn't underestimate the impact of little events. Sometimes it takes just a little bit of patience to work with people. Sometimes it takes just a little bit of love to redeem a situation. Sometimes it takes just a little bit of grace to bring about healing. Let me tell you, when God moved in history for the salvation of humankind, 
He did so with a, he did so with not, he did, I'm, I'm sorry. He did not do so with a legion of angels or some meeting of all the principalities of the earth or some grand display of power. He did so with the seed planted in the womb of a peasant girl. That microscopic seed would one day grow to full life, die for your sin and mine, and change the course of all creation. Get it to us. Trust me, my wife and I know about that. We know about the introduction of that microscopic seed into the womb of a woman that's produced two of our grandchildren. And Jacob talks about that, watching that through that electronic microscope as that fluid enters the womb of the person. You were born to be children of light, to shine in the dark places, brothers and sisters, and in some places it's never been as dark as it is today. Yes, we often think we have the proper perspective on an issue when in fact we're way off. Imperceivable things have a real influence. And Jesus said, this is what happened. Heaven is about you and I be in the conduit through which God pours himself into the world. We prayed this morning in that prayer that it be on earth as it is in heaven. That's my and your task. Through all the turmoil, through all the strife, through all the challenges, brothers and sisters, God's at work. And he's at work this day through you and me. He's at work this day through the church. Who would ever dream that this little piece of technology, this little box, square rectangular box that could fit in a shoebox, coming from this little church, in this little community will have the potential brothers and sisters to go around. Our ministry hasn't sequestered. Our ministry hasn't been quarantined. Our ministry has been turned loose. that the whole world might know that they're not forgotten. That the whole world might know, brothers and sisters, you and our own, that everyone might know that you are more important than a sparrow and God knows every sparrow in the heart. You are a seed that has the potential to grow and allow not just your life to be eternal, but those around you to rest in God's branches and make it a life of a life eternal through your ministry, through your work, through your witness. That's what the kingdom. Pray for you, God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you and fill your heart with gladness. May you know the joy that passes your understanding as you serve him. In Jesus' name, go in peace.
Bye, everybody.